Welcome. Hi, I'm Katherine Morris. I'm the Sackler Family Curator of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art here at the Brooklyn Museum. And on behalf of myself and my co-curators of Agiprop, Saisha Grayson, Jess Wilcox, and um, Stephanie Weisberg, who's standing there, sorry. Um, we welcome you to today's talk. We're very excited at the opportunity to have three remarkable artists who also happen to be a lineage within the curatorial project of Agiprop, which you'll hear more about in a minute. Um, Nancy Buchanan, Martha Rossler, and Andrea Bowers, thank you so much for being here today. Um, Saisha Grayson, the assistant curator of the Sackler Center, will be leading today's discussion. And um, if you wouldn't mind turning off electrical devices, that would be helpful. Thank you. And um, I'll turn it over to Sai. Thank you. Hello. Oh. <laughs> I'm Saisha Grayson. I'm the assistant curator, as Catherine said, of the Sackler Center and one of the four co-curators of the Agitprop exhibition. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today with you and our invited speakers um, for this program. This conversation is the kickoff event for wave two of the Agitprop exhibition and is both an opportunity to hear these three extraordinary artists speak and an opportunity to highlight the unique structure of this experimental exhibition, which includes these waves and these um, nominations. So for those of you who haven't seen or are just encountering our Agitprop show, some background. For years, Sackler family curator Catherine Morris has been interested in doing a show that would highlight the cross-cultural, trans-historical phenomena of artists forwarding political agendas and, in fact, doing politics through their work. In the spirit of Agitprop, uh, she thought, and its collective mode of production, she decided the project should be a co-curated venture with the entire Sackler Center, with um, Stephanie Weisberg and Jess Wilcox, as she said. As a group, we organize focused presentations of five historical case studies with, from the early 20th century. That's a moment when reproducible media allowed artists and activists to really creatively distribute their ideas quite widely. The case studies start with the Soviet Revolution, which birthed the term agitprop, a mashup of the word agitation and propaganda to emphasize the activation that was supposed to come through this pr um, practice. And we continued with Tina Medotti's socialist photography in Mexico, the visual rhetoric of the US suffrage movement, the WPA's living newspaper theater productions, and the NAACP's cultural campaign against lynching. We also developed an international selection of 20 living artists and collectives whose work would be presented alongside the historical material, allowing for lineages, recurrent issues, and shared strategies to emerge from this century-long span. But we didn't stop there. We had a few goals that encouraged us to experiment with the typical exhibition protocol. First, we wanted opportunities for other voices and opinions to enter the fray. We wanted to acknowledge our partial view of a global phenomena. And we wanted to present, um, have the presentation have some of the dynamism and performativity that often characterizes work not intended for static gallery experience. So with this in mind, we asked the first 20 artists that we had um, selected to nominate an artist collective or project that they thought was an outstanding example of agitprop. And then we worked with those artists to select projects and add those to a second wave of the installation, which just opened on Wednesday. Um, and then we got really crazy and we asked those second wave artists to nominate a third wave of artists and projects. And those will open um, April 7th additively to what's already upstairs and be on view through August 11th. And we sort of imagine this final round will look more maybe feel like the heated debates and, um, and excitement that comes when you're in a room of activists really debating their issues and um, bringing that excitement to it. So that's the genesis for the show upstairs and also for today's conversation, which features one chain of this nomination process. Martha Rossler is a brilliant artist, writer, and unrelenting agitator who is always on our list for the kickoff of the project. Since 1960s, Martha has worked in video, photography, text, installation, and performance with a focus on the public sphere, exploring issues from everyday life and the media to architecture and the built environment, especially as they affect women. Uh, she worked in the California, as the other two artists here um, did as well, uh, but she's now born and, uh, or she was born and is firmly based in Brooklyn. 
Throughout, um, Martha has produced work on war and national security climate, connecting life at home with the conduct of war abroad, especially in the photo montage series that are featured upstairs. She's also published several books, text commentary on public space, and um, has had retrospectives tour internationally. Her writing is published widely in Art Forum, Eid Flux Journal, and Text der Kunst. Uh, and most recently, in November, she was named the first recipient of the new foundation Seattle 100K Prize, which is allowing her to launch a series of year-long integrated projects and exhibitions, starting with um, Housing as a Human Right in Seattle, a reactivation of projects that she did in New York in 1989. Martha, in turn, nominated Nancy Buchanan. Nancy Buchanan is a Los Angeles-based artist who we are thrilled to have with us here in New York today. Her work often addresses social issues and her practice has included installation, drawing, mixed media, performance and video, as well as an interactive CD-ROM about housing and development. She was a founding member of several groundbreaking artist collectives, F Space Gallery, Grandview Gallery at the Women's Building in Los Angeles, and Double X of Feminist Art Network. She taught a variety of courses related to video art as well as art and politics at California Institute of the Arts from 1988 to 2012. She worked closely with Michael Zinzen from 1988 to 98 on a message to the grassroots, which is also on view upstairs, and on other projects with um, Michael, including a documentary about Namibia's transition to independence. Buchanan's work has been exhibited internationally, including at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, MoMA New York, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and MOCA LA, as well as part of the important traveling exhibition, React Feminism. In addition to producing her own work, Buchanan has also curated and written about exhibitions. And finally, Nancy, in turn, invited Andrea Bowers, um, also from LA, thank you for being here, um, whose work will go up in the third wave on April 7th. Working extensively with drawing and drawing-based installations, sculpture, videos, and actions, Andrea Bauer's projects intimately connect her art practice and her work with activists operating on the front lines of environmental issues, feminist challenges, and intersections with immigration, labor, and trans rights. Recent solo exhibitions include the just-opened Whose Feminism Is It Anyway? at Andrew Krepp's gallery, which I think we'll talk about more later, uh, Self-Determination at Kaufman Repetto Milan, In Situ, Andrea Bauer's at Espace Culturel Louis Vuitton in Paris, Hashtag Sweet Jane, Pomona, and Pitzer College Museum of Art, um, and Transformer at the Francis Young Tang Teaching Museum and Art in Skidmore. College. Uh, Andrea is a LA-based artist and studied at um, California Institute of the Arts where Nancy taught. Um, and so this is the amazing trio that we've brought together that have brought each other together really. And so without further ado, I'm going to engage them in what I'm sure will be amazing conversation. Thank you so much for being here today with us. And um, because we think of you as co-curators of this exhibition, I wanted to start by talking about um, the works that are in the show, but also how the invitation to nominate and fellow artist um, hit you when we first opened that up as part of the invitation to participate in an exhibition. That's sort of an unusual model. How you thought about who you wanted to invite, and then how you guys thought about which works made sense for this context from your own practice. You're asking us. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's my opening volley. <laughs> um, it threw me into a panic, <laughs> absolute panic. It took me ages to answer. Um, there were so many aspects of art and activism to consider, not to mention the title of the show, which is Agitprop. That's uh, a very specific type of address to the public. Um, I've been an ardent supporter of Nancy's work for decades upon decades, ever since we knew each other in California. Uh, her work is complex, always political in every aspect, feminist and other forms of activism as well, as always embodied, pervades all her thinking and is in every work. But because of the uh, agitprop part of the brief, I thought that it would be really important to bring forward something that she was an integral part of, though not the initiator of, but which I knew about at the time as it was occurring, which is the work that she did with Michael Zinzen uh, and students uh, 
every week or so. It was every week, in, every month in LA, uh, which was brought to a close by Michael's untimely death, and which I thought spoke to the present as well, to every audience, and for many reasons embodies not only um, Nancy's commitment to speaking, if you'll allow me, to the grassroots, but also her feminism in her collaborative relationship to it and her willingness to sort of take a back seat in its public presentation. So um, I, I propose Nancy and this pro project. And when I was thinking about uh, <laughs> who to nominate, um, actually, very quickly, I thought of Andrea because her work uh, always involves an activist group. She has managed somehow to bridge so many different issues with her work and yet still present things that are elegant, that are beautiful, but that bring in a lot more than just the artwork. Usually there's a component that involves some kind of activity out in the real world mm -hmm. um, so that people come away not just educated about the issue, but able to then contribute to change. I didn't have to curate anyone. I know, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm so honored to be in this chain because um, I think one of the most important things for me as an artist is the ethical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's probably five artists who I really look to for guidance in these issues, and th two of them are sitting on the stage right now. So it's Good odds. you know it's yeah. really wonderful to be a part of this that this exhibition yeah. brought us together with. Yeah, and one thing that came through as we were sort of talking about this and planning this was um, when we thought about this chain of nominations, we weren't really sure what the chain would be structured like. Would it be people people had uh, admired from afar or chains of influence? And my sense is that the three people I have on stage now are actually all friends. You're really a circle of friends and you hang out like this, <laughs> and maybe without the microphones and other contexts. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, kind of get you guys to talk a little bit about how each of you have gotten to the place where it absolutely made sense to fuse your activism and your art. Sort of, um, for some of you, that's sort of right away, and some of you, you thought about practices sort of separately, and they merge later on. And so, I don't know, maybe Nancy, if you wanted to start, I know you brought some clips. Okay. Okay. Um, well, when I was a student, um, an art student, I was also demonstrating against the war in, in Vietnam, and then I realized that I didn't have to compartmentalize my life, that I could bring the uh, subject right into my practice. And so that was like an amazing revelation at the time because it wasn't a very popular thing at that moment mm -hmm. in, in some art circles. Um, and uh, then uh, after that, I guess, um, one of the major central questions that I've always had is um, how can the individuals responsible for some of the problems uh, that we see uh, actually um, uh, think the way they do? Um, when I met Michael, I, I was actually uh, doing community art uh, workshops in the city of Pasadena. They had just set up their cable television station, and I did these workshops for adults and children. And I'd met Michael on an art panel, actually, in, a, in an exhibit. And um, then later on, as I was planning to leave the Public Access Corporation, he walked in one day and said, well, I want to produce a show. And I said, oh, great, I'd like to help you. And that was that. And then um, when I went on to work at CalArts, we had a program that was a public program where artists and students went out into the community and did their workshops out there. And I was in the film school, my partner was the Watts Towers Art Center. 
And I said, well, um, if I'm going to go to this center, I would like a collaborator who really uh, knows this community. Mm -hmm. And I will do it if you will also hire Michael Zinzin. <laughs> so, so then we also did these workshops together um, uh, with uh, people down in Watts and, and also um, uh, some of the members of the groups that came together in the historic gang truce in 1992. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the show, and that was also part of our, our workshops. Very cool. Um, and Martha, where did, do you want to? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, art and activism. Art. I was um, a junior abstract expressionist <laughs> painter in training. Partly here, I grew up about 10 blocks from here, and there was an art school that was half of the museum wing. Mm -hmm. It was a Sunday. We you're not going to find it up there. <laughs> oh, no, I know. I'm getting, well, we'll go back and forth. That makes sense. It was, one could say, for Sunday painters. <coughs> I was a high school kid, and uh, it was, there were real people teaching, you know, mm -hmm. serious painters teaching. So that's where I was when uh, I also became uh, a protester first against the uh, having to take cover for uh, air raid drills as though we could hide from a nuclear bomb. <laughs> uh, and it was illegal to not take cover and to be standing in the public space. Uh, took a while for me to try to integrate any kind of subjectivity, <laughs> aside from an abstract one, uh, into my work. But my in was actually photography, because I got the idea that the way that abstract painters dealt with narrativity was by taking photographs of things in real life, everyday life. You know. um, but um, I think it started with feminism in that I started making montages, photographic montages, obviously, uh, of uh, the representation of women. It was always a question of the representation and how that produces and promotes and carries on um, a picture of who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and one day, sitting at my mother's uh, dining room table looking at a, a photograph of a woman uh, a Vietnamese woman swimming across a river desperately with a child trying to escape, it occurred to me that that kind of imagery was central to trying to talk about who are we and who are the supposed they's and that I could incorporate this kind of work into the work that I was doing. And it took me about six or seven years to quit the painting which I carried on simultaneously, but at that point I was doing activist work, which I kept out of the art world, I have to say. It was not intended for the art world. It, wouldn't, it wasn't accepted. It was requested at various points, but that wasn't the point. It really was agitprop. Right. And, you know, it came up a little bit during the nomination um, discussion, but this idea of the definition of agitprop, you said there's something sort of that means something quite specific to you. Maybe talking about what that specificity is. For us, it had to do something with distribution, um, where it lands originally. Um, and then the other thing, um, she mentioned being an abstract painter, and you mentioned that um, activists, in some male activists, in your opinion, were sometimes like abstract painters, and I thought maybe you want to talk <laughs> about that moment where you bring those two together, that critique. Uh oh. Jeez, do I want to say that? <laughs> um, uh, from studying with, a, with many feminists, mm -hmm. you know, um, I went to school. I studied with Millie Wilson, Nancy was there, um, and then also studying with Charles Gaines and Michael Asher. Mm -hmm. um, Nancy, uh, let's see, I don't know. Anyway, I became really aware of issues of subjectivity mm -hmm. and that that was the standard modernist methodology for how you work, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, 
what did Pollock say? Like he's painting his internal arena or something like that. And um, it just seemed like if that was if that was the standard, then women and artists of color just didn't live up to that standard. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to work that way. I wanted to throw that out the window. Um, so I think in almost all of my work, there are jabs at this, these kind of like infant terrible, you know, these like, you know, e expressive, emotional, dysfunctional men yeah. <laughs> that are that are celebrated in the art world mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I realized though like once I became really involved in activism that especially in climate justice and environmentalism these same personalities existed and so just because I was doing activism didn't mean I was overcoming patriarchy <laughs> or mansplaining. <laughs> So, you know, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've been making some work like this that kind of comments on that. <laughs> yeah, um, this one you said is a radical feminist pirate ship, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> well, I was working with, you know, I got arrested for tree sitting in mm -hmm. uh, Arcadia, California. There was a, a forest of like 250 um, like pristine oaks and sycamores. And yeah, it was weird. I've never walked on ground like that where no one's ever walked, you know, and it was all this kind of like growth and it was really soft and it was pitch black because we were breaking in at like four in the morning. But um, anyway, there was four of us and one of them was this young man named Travis who spent three of the last six years as like an earth first activist living in a tree in Northern California. So he doesn't really make money living in a tree. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's doing really good work, but he has yeah. no money. So every once in a while, he would, you know, he would call and say, do you have any work for me? And I said, well, sure, let's make some sort of like, you know, um, pimp my ride tree sitting platforms. Because when you're in a tree, you can't sit on a tree branch right. for like a year. You have to live like... <laughs> You have to have a platform up yeah. there, and I thought it would be yeah. really funny to kind of make these really, yeah. which is in your show, like not yeah. this, but it's that's really one of the, the other tree sitting platforms. You know, I just see them as like super elaborate, ornate political posters because mm -hmm. they're covered in slogans and they're just really like entertaining. You can sit on it's uh, often you can sit in them, um, but I had said to Travis, I was like. Travis, so what's like your dream tree sitting platform? And he was like, a pirate ship. And I got like, I got like so pissed off because I was like, I would never have thought of that. Like there is this gender separation in my head that like, of course, of course a boy, a guy would make that, you know? Like I just don't have that mentality. So then I thought I'll make this radical pirate tree sitting platform. But like the problem with this piece is there's this m amazing quote from Mary Daly mm -hmm. about cultivating the courage to sin and being a radical feminist pirate that mm -hmm. was in the New York Times, which I love. But then, you know, I found out like that Mary Daly wrote, and it was a long time ago, but wrote a lot of transphobic mm -hmm. comments. And I didn't know that. I hadn't done my research properly. And so I kind of decided to correct that with this show. But like in, in, in a kind of amazing way, learning that led me to the current show that's up now, you know? Yeah. So, you know, to kind of address this particular piece that I did. That's always an interesting question, sort of how, I think all of you have so many intersexual, sectional issues. <laughs> <Did I just laughs> say that too, that too. Um, <laughs> we do, intersexual, we do. Intersectional, they're all part of a piece and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's a sort of root in feminism, but it leads you to so many different places and there are so many issues that you really take on at different moments. How do you, how does the urgency or how do you prioritize when you're across the board concerned about economic injustice, environmentalism, racial issues? I mean, how do you move between these and... <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you're looking at me. So. Um, I think that uh, I've been 
in the last several years, many years actually, really concerned about money and consumption. And so for me, it's like, how can I bring the issue of commodification and consumerism really up front? What's a new way to do that? Because to me, that's at the bottom of so much that's wrong. And in fact, I, pu I, I pulled up a, uh, a speech that Michael gave in 2002 in which he talked about that himself, you know, that that's the root of everything. That's the problem with police brutality. That's the problem with housing. That's the problem with almost everything is, um, are these um, issues of disempowerment and inequality. So, um, you know, there's, there's always a new way to, to represent it. And um, the uh, image on the left is from a, a web-based piece that was called Sleep Secure. And um, it invited people visiting the website to create uh, uh, a pattern inside one of the slices of the pie chart that the War Resisters League made. They make one every year to show you how the US taxes are uh, divided up in terms of how they're spent. And so um, I tried to find then web-based images for these different categories. And so you could click on one of the slices and then you could kind of play with it and you could make a pretty pattern, but you could also print out that pattern and make your own uh, real, vir not virtual, but physical quilt, you know? And uh, also, um, you, could, you could save your, uh, your decorative uh, pies uh, on the website and also. share them, right? So, yeah. um, I like to use some humor when I can with things and um, make them playful. And then on the right is, um, is a sequin embroidery that represents income inequality. And um, I kind of glommed on to George Bush's uh, statement about voodoo economics. And I thought, OK, all right, let's, let's, let's make some voodoo flags <laughs> about economics. Yeah. And I think that's interesting, because also, um, Martha, your meta-monumental garage sale and the garage sales was also this very sort of feminizing of an economic critique or getting at these things through the question of, sort of domestic into international um, economics. There's a quote, well, there's a wholesale quote from uh, Capital, um, commodity fetishism that plays continuously through all these garage sales as they occur, but I understood back in 73 that when, uh, actually this is built into the piece, it's um, one of the images, though not this, shows a, a very large reel-to-reel -reel, uh, tape player playing it. Uh, it's a meditation, but it's commodity fetishism. I understood that when you say to someone, here's some cheap stuff, they're not listening to somebody talking about commodity fetishism. but it was in itself a kind of uh, playing out of the fact that <laughs> the underpinnings of our lives are often neither audible nor visible, even though they're in our face every minute, which is kind of what you were talking about as well, I think, you know, the in, that you and Michael were both pointing to the way in which, uh, shall we say, bluntly capitalist, uh, and particularly neoliberal capitalism, um, basically controls who we are and how we inhabit our social spaces. Martha, I think it was night before last, or was it last night or night before last where you were talking about, um, I mean, like particular to being a, a woman artist, like you were talking about being invisible, mm -hmm. and then like, they want, I don't know if you talked about, that like then they want the old broads <laughs> back again or something, you know, it was like, like yeah. Yeah. this, like I don't, I don't feel like there's any equality in the art market right. whatsoever. Yes. So I don't, I don't know if you could talk about that at all. Like As like, the oldest one on the stage, yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, every actress will tell you this as well, that uh, as a, young female, you're a phenom, the talking dog, kind of, you know, like, wow, she's, 
got this shape and that shape and this shape, and she talks, she walks, she acts, she makes art. Look at that. Wow. Let's, you know. And then in middle age, eh, you know, the bloom's off the rose. I mean, that's then, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when you've reached a certain age, it's, look, she's still alive. Maybe we should talk to her before she <laughs> stops being alive. And, you know, so, yes. And, you know, there's nothing that has uh, changed, but the... When I say this sometimes to men, they say, oh, but I disappeared too. No, you didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you didn't. Uh, the course of, so the course of women's visibility is like this, which is not, so when I was talking about this to Suzanne Lacey, she said, we're not any more active than we used to be. I said, no, it's, a, it's visibility I'm it's talking visibility. about, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. But for men, of course, it's a much more, mm -hmm. well, more like that. And I think that's, you know. Yeah. Because I've been, we've been having some, some of, uh, some of my, some of the women artists my age in LA, we've been kind of meeting together because we're like all in our early fifties. You don't mean the group called Girls? Or oh something. yeah, <laughs> but we've been kind of like, you know, like there's like really discussing that kind of uh, the visibility issue because it hasn't changed really that much. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm talking about now. Yeah. Yeah. And do you feel like from inside the art world, there's what, what can you do? What, what would you like to see change that we should all be working on? Huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, as I mean, a curator, a, I, I mean, you're quality, conscious right? of like, it. Like, I think it, it's like visibility and it's economics. Right. I mean, we would, I would personally, of course, love to get rid of patriarchal capitalism, <laughs> but that's probably not going to happen immediately. Right. That's going to take a longer time. But in the meantime, I would like to see, you know, women um, have equality to men, you know, and have the same vis visibility and also survive financially. Mm -hmm. You know, I, yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I guess we do talks like this and say that this needs to be fixed. We do it in every way we can. Yeah. Um, throughout all of your projects, you also are very often building platforms and creating spaces for other people to present and talk about their issues. And I wanted to, you know, just kind of focus on that and open up the conversation about what, how that connects to feminism. Because I think very often, as you said, you know, you can feel conscious of the, your own invisibility and how that is created. And I think what that results in is feminist artists constantly making space for and opening up platforms for other people to speak to. Um, this kind of generosity that um, is built into a lot of the work, like Message to the Grassroots or the platforms that you've created um, and shifting focus. Well, I think that, that it's, um, it's a matter of um, deeply feeling and understanding our connection to other human beings, you know? I mean, that's, that's it. It's not, you know, me struggling to be at a certain level in, mm -hmm. in the art world or anywhere else, you know? It's, it's a real visceral, um, literal connection, mm -hmm. you know? We're all gonna sink or we're going to change. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I learned about you know, like an alternative practice through feminism in the 70s, studying you guys and some of your early practices. Like, why can't we have models of collectivity? Why can't, you know, uh, why can't we start to question authorship in some way? And for me, it's just about learning too. You know, like I need to be around other artists I respect so I can grow and learn. And also, I don't know, Nancy's always calling me, too, to, like, okay, there's this protest. Okay, there's this talk. You know, like, she, keep, she, she keeps me on my toes. You know, like, I need Great. that. That's what I need community to help me with. It's sort of selfish in a way for personal growth. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm so grateful for it. Um, the, obviously, the art world is... Um, driven at base by the fact that it's a market economy. Mm -hmm. And um, the institutions within it have to figure out how to carve out spaces that are relatively insulated from the payment structure. But because public spaces, on that 
the Freeze Art Tour, I literally forgot to have the group interview a dealer. We did everybody but every single person from the toilet keeper, which is a famous toilet at Freeze, right. to the sandwich uh, people and the uh, VIP lounge and the VVIP lounge, but I forgot to talk to the dealers, which was idiotic, but um, that's one of the VIP lounges. So they're, they're every institution within it tries to open up a space of autonomy, but those constraints can never be cast aside, and there are obviously the museum world is driven by donors and budgets that come from places where people don't look kindly on stuff that doesn't exactly fit that aesthetic separation between the street and uh, mm -hmm. um, the museum itself. And there's something to be said for that, but um, uh, this is not, there's a constant negotiation of how we make a space within these places, but I think also for curators, they have to answer to that same structure. Mm -hmm. You can't do a show because you feel like doing a show, you have to sell it, and then it has to go up the chain, and then it takes years or whatever. Um, it, it was a moment of relative democratization, oddly enough, uh, because the art market was not doing that well in the US in the 70s, mm -hmm. when we had artist-run spaces, and it, when the market reestablished, and I mean this quite literally, the market with neo-expressionist neo painting reestablished a certain kind of control over the whole system, the funding for artist-run spaces was yanked which meant that we then had to be cast back on uh, the kindness of institutions. But at the moment, because of the gigantic floods of wealth flowing everywhere through the economy, the art fair has actually supplanted the exhibition model, which mm -hmm. makes things a lot worse. Mm -hmm. They're not worried about ethics. I mean, people with big bucks to buy a Wu-Tang album and stick it in the drawer or whatever the hell it is. <laughs> what they're buying. <laughs> there, there was a great moment at one of the recent LA art fairs where um, some younger artists, Audrey Chan and Alana Mann, remounted oh uh, Suzanne Lacey and uh, Leslie Labowitz piece about myths of rape. And so at this cocktail reception, when people were, you know, enjoying themselves and having their drinks, they, uh, you know, were accosted or confronted by young people carrying colorful signs and talking about this is a myth about rape and here's the truth. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was a nice collision, I thought. That's an interesting example because it touches on something that also kind of keeps coming back, which is both the usefulness of history in a lot of your projects. You work with archives a lot. You revive the structure of certain strategies. You called it a, a metacriticism at one point. And, and the question of why we're either not learning from history or how we can learn better from history through um, a look to the archives, a look to older um, performance projects that are in danger of being lost and so become re-performed, this kind of strategy? I mean, I think archiving in a certain way accidentally fell into my lap because most of my projects sort of start with an activist that I learn about just through, you know, circles of friends or I seek, I seek out because I see they're doing something and I email them or I try to get a hold of them. But what I started finding out was that all of these activists that I would go and like interview in videos, because I almost always interview in videos, because I'm trying to create literally an archive of activists that, you know, during my lifetime that I think are amazing and maybe underrepresented. But what I discovered was in all of their closets or in all of their drawers were these amazing archives that no one was seeing. So I just asked them if I could scan them. I'd give them all the scans back, and then that started that starts circling into you know social media and stuff, and then you know I'm collecting all of that stuff too. But it's really about under-recorded, underrepresented, underseen, really important historic events because activism doesn't end, right? These actions don't end. They they 
people work their lifetimes doing different things, but the issues keep coming up again and again and again. So it's important to look back at those things. So I'm just trying to, mm -hmm. I don't know, use my art skills to like bring them out in the public more there, in any little way I can. There's a, a trend in academe and uh, perhaps elsewhere to critique the idea of um, collaboration mm -hmm. and participation. And uh, interestingly, a number of these uh, attacks on inclusiveness have come from female scholars, which I always found interesting. Um, I did write a little bit about it beforehand in the book that I did on the, the culture class, the idea that somehow public projects wind up being social management tools uh, for social and political elites. Uh, but that's a totalizing criticism. I hope I'm not becoming incoherent. A totalizing criticism of something, that's a process that's actually very porous. The idea of inviting other people in to whatever space you've been accorded for whatever amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is twofold. One is you never want to speak for people, which mm -hmm. is really a serious issue. And there have been a number of critiques about re-performance. I'll just mention Kenny G, for mm -hmm. example, and uh, other critiques of people who tried to reproduce the speak, speech of people who are not in a position to speak or whatever, which is not, not a small issue. This is serious. A lot of the critique does stem from academes, so we have to be careful. But repeatedly, when I've invited other people to participate with me, I've run into a problem with the curators and the art space who refuse to acknowledge, and someone is here who, Noah, if you're still here, who's actually worked directly on this issue, Noah Fisher with Occupy Museums, the problem of saying, no, it's not a work by me, it's a work by me and this person and this person and this person and this person and this person. And um, Noah is the only person I know, actually, um, who has managed to write a contract in which the institution acknowledges the co-authorship of the other people who've participated because otherwise you wind up against your will in a subordinate re with people in a subordinate relationship to you because of the way the institution mm -hmm. insists on uh, naming. And uh, I think this is something that's never talked about publicly, the way that institutions themselves insist on saying, I nominated you, you don't have the right to nominate yeah. anyone else, which is what makes this particular exhibition unique. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I want to say Interference Archive, which is in this show, which has this great poster that says, we are who we archive, right? So really okay. understand, isn't that fantastic? <laughs> and they great. gave us a wall label with, I think, 60 people's names, mm -hmm. every single person who's involved in that group during that period of time, because we do want to say this is not, we're not trying to shut down the the market-driven interest, you know, based on the market-driven interest to, to name one artist in relation to this. Yeah. My friends, Christine and Margaret Wertheim, who made the Crochet Coral Reef, which has traveled around the world, felt that the reason why some places didn't want to take their work and why there's no market for it is that they insisted on every single name of every person involved and being a part of that work, that they would not, you know, allow it to be represented as by Christine and Margaret Wertheim. Yeah, it is not the status quo of how institutions tend to work, and it's something that the artists pushing back on is part of the, the way we change this, yeah. I thought the WAC show was amazing, but I thought that it kind of didn't, it stood, it kept to that tradition mm -hmm. of like the individual. I felt like it didn't deal with coll collectivity enough, although I, that show is super important. But I don't know, it's, I was wondering, you know, like Nancy wasn't in it, Nancy should have been in that show. Exactly. You know, but I'm wondering if there's a curatorial model, like this is an interesting curatorial model well, for like 
collectivity or I don't know. I, I, want, I wanted that show to have more of that in it. I have a little rant about this kind of thing that I have <laughs> been developing in my head. Oh, please give us a rant. Which has to do with the fact that at the moment, the anti-war flyers that I did, the montages are in a number of shows in three different places in the US, and each place wanted to show the newspapers. Well, the works were done in the, like, 65 to 70 or whatever. The newspapers were because I was part of a feminist newspaper collective and we happened to throw a couple of them into the newspaper in the 70s. And I understand that art historians need proof. The degree to which the proof is even to the point where they're like thinking, you say you did this, but <laughs> prove it. But, okay, so I then, ask these places belatedly to show flyers. Of course, I don't have the flyers from the 60s. They rotted and I threw them away. But it occurred to me, let's just make some flyers, but you can't give them out because you're not giving out anti-Vietnam stuff, but at least put them in the vitrine. Mm -hmm. But I had an even more annoying realization, which is a photo by Ron Haberly, I guess, if he's the one who took it, mm -hmm. of the My Lai Massacre. Yeah. Suddenly in the art world, people, it's, it, I happened to put it in one of my Iraq montages and someone, curators cannot stop themselves from saying, and babies. And it occurred to me that that photograph, which the world knows as a photo of the My Lai Massacre, has a little TM at the top, Guerrilla Art Action Group, mm -hmm. and babies. And they know it only as a, an art intervention at which point I felt like throwing my hat in the air that way, as in, what was that, Goldfinger, and leaving. Because this is a kind of an ossified mindset that comes from people who have been trained, and rightly, to verify historical facts. Mm -hmm. But they become so stuck in the fetish, fetishization of the evidence that they have trouble stepping backward to an actual uh, larger event or a larger piece of evidence, but that goes along with this problem of segmenting the artist as the one who gets nominated and everybody else is, who the hell are you? And, and focusing on the fetishized object instead of the issue or the moment or the event that's being brought up. Um, speaking of fetishization, maybe we can end with one, one question I have. I'm just gonna keep going back to We're sexual jokes. We're just getting started. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Did have questions? Yes, no, we will go to the audience, but I wanted to ask, you know, I, w I read a number of interviews sort of preparing for this, and almost in each case you guys are asked to speak to the efficacy of activist art. You know, did you successfully end the war or stop patriarchy um, through yes, your work? Yes, we did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. So maybe it's just a settled question. But I was wondering, I think you all start in feminism, and I think maybe it gives you a better place to work in activist spaces without an expectation of sort of these totalizing successes or failures, whether you think that there's a connection between um, feminism as a root ideology mm -hmm. and a comfortability with sort of focusing on the work and sustaining the movement instead of imagining that you are gonna be the hero um, when you wake up tomorrow. Though maybe you already are, yeah. Well, I activism actually think you is are. a process. Yeah. And we're dealing in a world of objects, I mean, I mean, it's in, you know, activist change is inherently about collectivity, right? We're back at that idea again. So all you can do is you can do your part, right? You do your part, you speak up, you know, as a citizen, right? It's about citizenry. And you, word right at it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you trust that there are others who are like-minded, who are out there working as hard as you are, and together, over time, change will occur. And it's, a, it's this activist, I forget his name, his first name's Chris, from San Francisco, mm -hmm. who said, you know, and I, radical hospitality, or radical patience, radical patience, right? You have to have radical patience, like knowing that it was started before you and it will continue after you. Yeah, I, I um, have a quote from Michael, which I think is, is really important. Michael uh, Zinzin founded the Coalition Against Police Abuse in 1976. 
and um, was tireless as a worker and an advocate right. working with families whose children or loved ones had been injured or killed by the police and a lot of other issues. So, um, and, he, and he called for a lot of changes that we still need to change today about racial profiling, about demonizing young people, and he ended this, this speech that I found by saying, we have a motto in Kappa that we all should relate to. We won't struggle for ya, but we will struggle with ya. We can bring some lessons and experience to the struggle, but the most important one is that the people are their own liberators. That's great. Thank you. I want to say something about art. Okay, because great. Because you asked specifically about art and did you guys stop the war? And, you know, I, I want to affirm that I think art is revolutionary and I mm -hmm. truly mean that. Mm -hmm. I think we probably all do, but art doesn't make revolution. Mm -hmm. People make revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's as citizens that we struggle. And if our art is imbricated and implicated in that struggle, that's what we do, but it's still people who make the revolution, whatever that revolution is. Emery Douglas said art should be in service of the revolution. Yeah. I mean, it's that simple for me. Yeah, and one thing that's great about the show having these historic components is that I think you can actually see moments when the issues like police brutality that have not been you know, solved overnight and continue to be things we struggle on, and then the US suffrage movement where we can vote, right? So we have visibility issues and things we're still working on, but that did help build a movement that, um, that changed something very important and material. Hmm. You don't want an argument, so I won't give you one on oh. what, how actually what suffragism did was mm -hmm. it foreclosed the revolutionary movement that was women. Yep. It gave us something we needed, but then people said, and now go home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, I agree. Oh, can I ask one more thing? Sure. Okay, so I, I want to talk to you guys about this because there have been so many negative kind of transphobic comments from second wave feminists and it's freaking me out and I'm really worried and like, you know, there are these young radical feminists who are, who are making transphobic comments like, I don't understand why we're not, why this feminist movement isn't embracing trans women. Can I? Say yeah. Something? Yeah. First of all, I object to the characterization of second wave feminism because it was. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Just, yeah. yeah. Well, that's my preamble because it's an academic born distinction and it's full of shit. Because I always ask the young guys who come for work for me, mm -hmm. what is it? And they give you some bullshit definition which involves exclusions. First of all, let's remember that there, are, there were numerous, the reason it was called second wave feminism was because when we reinvented feminism, some of the older women said, idiots, this is the longest revolution. It's been going on for a while. Oh yeah, but we just invented it. All right, all right, we're another wave, we're the second wave. It was simply a historical marker that we acknowledge our foremothers. But feminism, oddly enough, unlike any other movement, attacks its four people, its ancestral lineage. I'm being sarcastic, but, but there are a few media chosen feminists mm -hmm. of our age mm -hmm. who say idiotic things, and I would say that they do not represent the vast majority of the older feminists, and it's a it's a convenient distinction. And I'd also like to remind people that what was called radical feminism, and it's, except for the media women who are saying these things, the media chosen names like Germaine Greer, who's mm -hmm. been crazy for a long time, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Why? You know. I think that this is an artificial distinction between who, as a feminist who 
basically found my voice as a feminist in California, I would always say there were no leaders. They were more likely to be people like Roxanne Dunbar than Gloria Steinem, who was, after all, a bourgeois feminist. But socialist feminism was a really important element of feminism. Mm -hmm and radical feminists were separatists. Mm -hmm. The voices that we're hearing of exclusion, I have to say very often, except for the media chosen voices of you know, mediatized women, um, stem from women who are radical feminists to the point of being essentializers. But out of that as well came the trans movement, which is interesting, like Pat Califia, was that her name? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So these schisms have been going on for a long time. It's just we didn't have social media to carry them forward. And I really seriously object to the idea that a lot of so-called second wave right. feminists are I mean, somehow in a lot of ways, rejected it's more women like, and not the, born the with deep equipment. Deep Green Resistance, the women from Deep Green Resistance, you know, who, who call themselves radical feminists. And yeah, and uh, yeah. I, yeah, I agree, but I just want to get that. I, I kind of wanted you to respond that way because I feel like this schism is kind of growing through social media, and I'm trying to yeah, bring you have your to, point forward. You have to ask who it serves, so. Yeah, yeah, Which exactly. is maybe not always a nice answer. Well, and what happened to the notion that there isn't some monolithic thing called mm -hmm. feminism? Mm -hmm. It's always multiple. It's always mm -hmm. all over the place. It's all over the world. It's, you know, there isn't one group. Mm -hmm. And no, nobody has the right to speak for all feminists. Mm -hmm. At the time, traveling in other countries, I was invariably met by people saying in a very hostile manner, well, feminists are just lesbians, which, you know, is true and untrue. It was the word just that was the problem, but, you know, it's easy to have, it's like, you know, there's a, an attack that's made on people on the basis of some element of their multiplicity, which then becomes a convenient spear with which to stab you whenever possible and shut you up. I don't think that the division between older and younger women is a useful one. I think it's incredibly divisive, and I'm very okay, much agreeing with Nancy can that we, it's a multiple. Can we, um, what, do I, what do I call what happened in the 70s in feminism if I can't call it second wave? Well, you can call it that as long as you don't accept that it's an actual doctrinal okay, yeah. split. I would add, in looking at all of your work, I was so struck by this, you know, the term intersectional feminism is used now sometimes as if it's a distinction from second wave feminism, which again, I find so untrue and unvaluable in the larger discussion. Um, but thinking of other voices, I'm gonna um, encourage us to open up to the audience now. Um, so if there are questions, um, we are being live streamed, so please go to the can, aisles. So can I just, say one more thing? I just sure. talking about co co collaboration. I just wanted to say that these photos mm -hmm. were a collaboration with Ada Tanel, who's sitting in the audience. So Fantastic. she gets Thank half you. the authorship for those two. <laughs> Great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't think I have the ability to put it on scroll mode, but if in, in the back, if you want to put the PowerPoint on scroll mode, and then um, we'll take questions from the audience. Um, please go to the aisle for the microphone so that, um, that it gets picked up and recorded for posterity. Well, first, thank you very much. This has been great. Um, to allow women to be seen as great artists or great anything since forever, to allow that to happen or not happen is very deep. And my question is, in countries that have more equality for women or are less capitalistic, do you, do you find that or do you feel that they promote women artists um, more than we do? Which country is that? Yeah, I was going to say, what countries <laughs> um, well, are those? Well, all, all, for instance, Iceland, all of the Nordic... Nordic countries or some of the European countries where they're less capitalistic and women are represented and have more rights, do they have also more rights in the art world or, or seen or promoted? 
I lived in Sweden. No. <laughs> um, you know, capitalism is the hegemonic system. Uh -huh. It controls everything. When I say capitalism, I don't mean some, you know, uh, fang-toothed monster. I'm talking about our, the way our global economy works. Uh, Sweden has a vibrant feminist movement, and one of the reasons it's so vibrant is because they believe in um, equal rights, but they know that they're nowhere near equality, and it's only recently that women have achieved any level of, uh, it's like the question about African American players, if they don't get to be managers, you know there's a problem with the system that uses them uh, as players, so women, there were no women running museums in Sweden until Mama, and it's still a problem now. Some women are running lower level, that is less prominent museums, like not the Moderna Mosaic. It's a little, it was a little better in Finland, actually, but there is no such country. And they still st sell their stuff on the international market, and it's still people who donate work that determine what gets shown. I'm curious about how feminism shapes your critiques of consumerism for each of you. And Ms. Rosler, for instance, I'm thinking of your use of the image of the supermodel and your recent uh, return to House Beautiful and um, what her role is within uh, your critique of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, do you want to try that first? You were talking about consumerism. Well, that she referred to House Beautiful. <laughs> OK. so. Um, the original set of these anti-war montages had uh, women in um, mostly from home settings because they were from the magazines that everyone received in their houses and you saw women. Um, the ones that I did about the representation of women in advertising tended to focus on things like lingerie ads or makeup and things like that, but the anti-war ones it were, except for the one that we saw, were by and large about women with vacuum cleaners or uh, n not that many women. It was more the setting. Uh, there were only a few women uh, who were not Vietnamese. Um, but the nature of the home magazine has changed. And in the interim between the 60s and 70s when I did that project and now, we've seen the emergence of the the uh, lionization of models and modeling. Be before that, models were considered to be clothes horses, idiots. Um, it was not a it was not a position of status until celebrity culture took over. So um, most of the women whose images were available to me were walking down runways uh, in newspapers and magazines and. Uh, not that, that struck me as the, I'm sorry for going on so long, it struck me as being the uniform, the militarized uniform of the representation of the newly glamorized home space. Mm -hmm. I hope that made some sense. Yeah, and speaking They are working women. But Speaking of homes, also the whole issue of the real estate market, you yeah. know, I mean, that, that has become this bizarre commodified area. Um, and fetishized as well, right, within the, the interior magazines, which are porn for a certain kind of design aesthetic itself. Other questions? Hi. Um, I just wanted to go back really quickly to um, what Andrea was speaking to about uh, transphobia and transmisogyny in, in some sections of the second wave, but not all. And I wanted to ask about that in terms of the idea of collaboration, and you said that you used some of Mary Daly's quotations or that you drew power from them in a way before you realized that she had written some things that you vehemently disagreed with. And my question is really, can you collaborate with people that you dissent with? And is that even possible? And is that really a collaboration in that way? So I had, so before, right the day before the show opened, I figured out about this quote. And so I was having a panic attack, like a little pa literal panic attack, and I was in Germany. So I actually called Suzanne Lacey, and I was like, 
oh my God. Like, what do I do about this? And she was like, oh, I didn't realize Mary Daly said those things. <laughs> you know, like, whatever. But she's like, look. She's like, let's look at it this way. Look at what some of those Black Panthers said, you know, and who are, who are totally idolized. You know, let's look at some of the male, uh, like, activists who, who, who kind of, you know, there's so many who or male, I don't know, male writers who said some kind of really awful things. Like, we don't throw their whole personas or their whole, you know, their whole body of work, right? Life's work out the window because in certain aspects they said some, you know, nuts or politically incorrect things, right? And she said, so why would we do that to women? And, you know, she said, you know, let's look at the time it was written, you know, um, and it started to make me think about, you know, instead of heroicizing these people that come before us, to think about them as complex individuals and humans. And so, I mean, it really changed my thinking, but it was through talking, th talking through it with a lot of people. Like that we have to have a, a whole new model for how we look back on generations and what we kind of idolize or look up to and, and trying to change my whole pattern and, or my whole model for how we do that. I don't know, do you guys have anything to say about that? I don't know. Um, it's a problem that we know nothing about history and yet history is an open table mm -hmm. where you can find things that maybe you wish so-and-so hadn't said. Right. And it becomes very problematic, but I would also support what you said. Why should we do this to women? But I think that this is a really serious issue. Um, I'm sure I won't surprise anyone by saying I'm a Bernie Sanders supporter. Yay, Flatbush. But I'm completely I, I horrified. I feel the burn. Yeah, I feel no the burn. <laughs> I'm completely <laughs> horrified by the attacks on Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. which are just outrageous. Yeah. And the interesting thing is they don't have to be about her status as a woman in order to be within a general, uh, let's not say misogynistic, let's say patriarchal framework. The way that what's ordinary and normal for politicians is something that's somehow sticking to her like mud that can't be removed. So you do have to recognize that oppressed groups and those with less power are always going to be easy targets. I'm not defending misogyny mm -hmm. in any way uh, at all. I'm not defending, and I'm referring to what you said about Black Panthers. Black Panthers, or, Panthers right. It wasn't just Panthers, but the men in the movement is what created feminism. But, um, or like the way, transphobia say, the, the, is, the Paris, you know, the situation has treated women. You know, like that was the same thing. Mm, I would say the, uh, Beatniks and the Robert mm -hmm. Frank crew were worse. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I think that debate of who's worse could go on for a long time. We can right. carry it on afterwards. I love Robert um, Frank's work. I know, me too. Um, yeah, thank you so much for um, having putting on this conversation. And it was really interesting. Um, the question that I wanted to ask was kind of around issues of um, complicity and autonomy and the relationship between sort of global imperialism and um, racial domination domestically and the ways that women oppress other women and how we're complicit in these sort of global systems. And I'm thinking of, in particular, sort of the constructions of the desire for the American dream or for commodities and the ways that you all balance um, how, we, how our desires are actually constructed to replicate these different types of oppressions and how that plays out in your work. If that makes sense. It's a big one. Who's, who's it's, big one. <laughs> it's such a high level of, of abstraction, it's a little bit difficult to grab hold of. Well, I'm thinking, well, something that I'm thinking of in particular is again, in like the Bringing the War Home series, the ways that young, young women turned into sort of housemakers actually desire something like an American dream or something like these commodities and the ways that these commodities might, you know. A lot of my process. work is about desire. The garage sale is about desire. Mm -hmm. 
and women's role in the economies of desire and complicity. Um, I don't, I do think, I'm not smart enough to attack it directly. To By attack, I mean take it on as an issue because it is very high level of abstraction in terms of social uh, thinking. But one hopes that work that one does sets off trains of thought within viewers. Um, I, I'm not a... I'm not a Protestant either. I'm not against desire, and I'm not against, you know, trying to remake the world, whether it's the world close at home or the larger social world. So I, to talk about implication would require a really long conversation, which is not so appropriate right now. But I do appreciate this is a major issue about who gains, who losses, but. I think if people are only motivated by guilt, we consume. A lot of my work also has been about that. You know, they make, we take. You know, um, that is m much too complicated to just answer a question relating to an image or a set of images. It's you know, um, Nancy's uh, work. Nancy did a. A kind of uh, never-ending video project called The American Dream, yeah, gonna... which is precisely about these issues of, you know, desire, home, remaking, and real estate values, and, you know, and there was a quote from one of them that, I'm going to paraphrase it, you know, good news, your neighborhood's coming up, bad news, but not for you, and that's from one of your videos where you have a community yes. activist yeah. saying it. And, you know, I've used that quote over and over again because it really tells you about dispossession, possession. And, and that, that also fits in with how artists get caught up in gentrification and all of those things. Yeah, that was from the 25th anniversary of the, uh, the Watts uh, riots um, in 1965. And uh, yeah, and now, now also, um, with regard to the gang truce and things like that, I just ran across um, an ecstatic uh, realtor who was advertising the fact that now in Compton it's getting safer and <laughs> it's a great time to invest, and you know people will be displaced. Um, I'm loath to end on that sad <laughs> note, but, um, but I think our time is up. So maybe these conversations can continue in the gallery and through the work that is amazingly on view and, um, and through all the juxtapositions that you'll see there. So thank you for joining us today and um, go upstairs and see the show. Thank you guys, thank you so much. <laughs>